I'm not so nervous about the, uh, what the scripture says uh, right there <laughs> to preach this um, as I am in, in uh, being misunderstood at what I think, I, what I'm trying to convey of how my understanding of this particular passage is. Um, and you can, you can double check with my wife, Julia, who's always in the back uh, working with, uh, with Kids Church, uh, some of the stuff that I have to say up here. Uh, if if uh, these are discussions that we have had, uh, I'm going to say yes, uh, yes to that. Um, remember, we are in Ephesians. Ephesians is about uh, identity, who you are in Christ Jesus as an individual and how we are as a, as a church body, as, as the church gathered together. Um, you are a lot of things, and I don't want you to, to focus solely on your identity as in your relationships, your horizontal ones. Who am I married to? Uh, who am I working for? Or who's working underneath me? Who, is my, uh, who are my mom and dad, or am, I, or am I a child, in terms of my identity? My identity is in Christ. Uh, I am adopted. Uh, I have been redeemed. I am part of his inheritance. Uh, all the things that we've been discussing here in, in Ephesians, uh, none of that stuff uh, goes away. And I, and I want you to, uh, especially if you're, if you're single in here, and you're like, well, we're going to spend the next uh, four Sundays, including today, talking about family. Right? So this is uh, part of family. This is roles that wives have. Uh, I spend two Sundays, I'm going to talk about roles that, that husbands have. And then I'm going to spend one Sunday talking about roles that, that kids have. Uh, and then we move into roles of um, employers and employees. And what does that, maybe what does that look like? Uh, I'll be gone that particular Sunday, but Sir Chaplin, uh, Jay Lee will, will do awesome well in bringing us uh, the scripture on that. What, what, does, that, what does that mean uh, in terms of the work relationships? Um, but if you're single, you're like, where, is that, where does that leave me? Um, Part of, part of where that leaves you is, it's good to know, uh, because you're probably uh, one day going to be married yourself. Uh, statistically speaking, you're probably going to find somebody to spend a, a, to commit a lifelong commitment to, uh, and you kind of need to know what you're moving into, how the scriptures describe uh, marriage. So I think it's important uh, in that way. And I think it's also important to know what are the scripture not telling you and how your relationships may be uh, from a, a romantic standpoint as well. So I think it's, uh, there's all sorts of value in that as you listen in uh, on uh, this particular talk, uh, because it's really about Jesus in a lot of, lot of ways. So uh, how Christ deals with us and how we are supposed to relate ourselves to Jesus, uh, you should see yourself in this, even if it's talking to wives, husbands, you don't get off uh, on on a tangent and say, well, this doesn't necessarily apply to me other than I need to know what I need to force my wife to do for me. And, and if you get that from me, you're wrong because that's, that's the wrong question. Um, I, I mentioned the whole passage, some things to remember. And one of those is when we were walking through the descriptions of sexual sin, I had mentioned to you that this is not a passage you look, you pull up your telescope or your microscope and you turn to your, your, your spouse next to you and start to inspect them and go, aha, I knew it. You're not following the word of the Lord and I am here to be the enforcer of that. This is not, this is not that particular passage. So husbands, if you're, you, you pick up on something that I say, I do not want you to come the drive home to, to lunch and be like, remember what the pastor said, my beautiful wife. Remember what he said. That, that's not for you to enforce. Uh, that's not for you to enforce. That is, a, that is something between your wife and the Lord Jesus uh, and how this is going to manifest itself uh, out. That I was talking, I did, <laughs> um, well, I'll get to that point in a second. So last week we talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit or being filled by the Holy Spirit. And it talked about submitting, one of the last things. If you're filled, there was five things that they all ended in ING. Uh, what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled by the Spirit? And the last one, in verse 21, it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That word reverence is, is fear, out of the fear uh, of Christ Jesus. And it's going to make itself appear again later on in this particular passage. But that word is, is fear. Uh, later on in verse, uh, I think it's 31, where it says, you know, husbands, love your wives, and wives, uh, 
It says, respect your husbands. That word respect is actually the same word here in this, out of reverence for Christ. I'm not saying you should fear your husbands. Um, we're going to come to that. What does that mean? But if you want to put respect in here too, submitting to one another out of respect for Christ, what Christ has done, who he is in his person, um, all the things that, that we're required to do as believers in Christ, you are called to, to be, it's action-oriented. I, I don't just sit around and wait for God to do things, although there's a lot of uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit or the filling by the Holy Spirit is passive. And that's God doing that for you. But in Ephesians, there's this beautiful blend of God doing all these things in your life and you being a participant in the midst of that, whether that's waiting on God to, to move in your heart or you doing action steps. If you are a believer in Christ, you can't just sit back. It's not a, Christianity is not a passive faith. It's very active and it's involved. It's active and it's, and it's involved. So we are to do that uh, out of reverence, out of respect, out of fear of the Lord Jesus. And this submitting to one another is a togetherness. This is me submitting to my wife and my wife submitting to me. And so it's not, it's not just a, a one-way street, but my submission to my wife is going to look differently than her submission to me. And that's, that's an important piece. Um, this Everything that follows after this, talking about uh, relationships between husbands and wives, relationships between parents and kids, and, and workers and uh, em employer employees, all are looking back to this particular verse saying, submit to one another. But that, differently, we have different roles to play out in what that, what that looks like, marriage, family, and work. So this is kind of the, the hinge verse on that. Um, what does the word submission mean? Uh, it means to place yourself under someone's authority. Uh, that's what it means. It's fairly simple in that nobody will say that. I'm going to use the word voluntary attitude of, of giving in and cooperating under somebody's authority. The, the word uh, submitting in uh, uh, verse 21 is the middle voice, which means that somebody has chosen to do that chosen to do that out of a particular reason. And part of that's the worshiping of, of God that we are to submit to one another out of reverence and respect for Christ, what Christ has done. There's something about that in his order for that. But it's a voluntary attitude of doing that. And the word also means obey. It's the same word as used uh, down in chapter 6, verse 1, right? Children, obey your parents. That word is submit. Uh, submit to them. So I'm going to say that the word, that this passage is, is simple, it's clear, but it's also counter to current Western thought in a lot of ways. Um, but it is clear, and it is simple. When I asked my wife, I said, Julia, what, how, how do you think I should approach this? She's like, I don't know, it says what it does. Maybe just say that and be done with it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm going to do that for you right now. This is my wife's version, and then I will give you, I'll fill in after, after that. The command is in verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That's the command. The reason why, in verse 23, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. To what extent are you sub supposed to submit yourself under the authority of your husband? And now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, to be up front, I'm a complementarian. I'm not an egalitarian. So in, in the theological world, that means something. So if you're reading stuff, uh, I, I put all my cards on the table, even the way I, I've probably even approached this text already. I've said I'm a complementarian, not an egalitarian. Um, and that'll flesh itself out a little bit more. I, just, I don't want to try to pretend that I, I don't lean one particular way over the other. Uh, again, and my wife was just, just be blunt. To what extent am I supposed to, to fall under the authority of my husband? And she was like, it says everything as unto the Lord. And just so you don't think it's just this one particular passage, and I... So I'll, I'll nuance it for you so it's not going to sound so strange. But I want it to just sit on your ears because it's kind of counter the way we think about things in the Western world. 
And I'll tell you what it doesn't mean in a little bit, but I'm not going to get there just yet. Uh, in Colossians, Paul says the same thing. This is in chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, and this is his, the shortness of it. In Ephesians, he gives a little few more words about, uh, about this command. But in Colossians, this is all he talks about to the wives. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting uh, for the Lord. Uh, I mention this verse because you could make an argument in, in Ephesians here that in, chapter, in verse 22, the word submit in the Greek doesn't exist. And that is true. Uh, it says, submitting uh, one another out of reverence for Christ, wives unto your husbands as to the Lord. Uh, it misses that word, although it picks it back up in verse 24, so I don't know why you'd make a big deal about it. Um, but here it is in Colossians 3.18, and it's clearly there. 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6, I know it's really small, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So that's Peter talking about um, placing well, wives placing themselves under the authority of their husband. Here's Titus 2. Paul picks up a command to older women says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slave to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train that the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Um, you're going to hear me say this in a couple of weeks, uh, that the Bible never tells wives to, to love their husbands. And there you're going to remember Titus chapter 2 here. I just read it. It says, teach women to love their, their husbands. And, and when I say the word, the Bible doesn't command wives to love, I mean agape love their husbands. It never says that anywhere. Agape love is the unconditional love that God gives us unconditionally. That command is to husbands. Husbands, unconditionally love your wives. He doesn't give that to two wives. This particular love in this, in this passage is uh, phileo. Teach the younger women how to be friends with their husbands, how to be friends with their kids, be friendly towards them. And that's a different aspect. And I think uh, Paul picks that up in Ephesians 5.31, where he says, husbands, what? Love your wives, that's agape love. Wives, uh, respect your husbands. There's a, a likeness about it. Um, and men respond to, to like a lot. I don't know if you were dating, if you remember back before you got married, um, I, for me, this was true. My wife would say, I love you, Matthew. And I'd be like, I like you a lot, right? And that's the joke. Like the men are like, I like you too. And you're like, no, do you love me? Like, well, I don't, I like you, right? I like being around you a lot. I don't know if I'm ready to commit myself fully in that way because love means something. It means I'm about to lay my life down for you. I don't know if I'm ready to commit to that, right? Got a thumbs up in the back. That's what happened to me. Yeah. Um, so those are, but those are two different words, two different languages that, that, we, that we are speaking, and we kind of, we kind of need, uh, need each other. So here's some things about submission, some thoughts, what it's not. Uh, sometimes I go, I wish maybe I didn't have to do this, but I have to just in case you, you hear me say something I'm not trying to say. Putting yourself under somebody else's authority does not mean you lack ability. No, the, the Bible, when it talks about men uh, leading in the house, the, the Bible doesn't necessarily even say that. Um, we, get, we get that from the word headship uh, in this particular passage where, where that's the head of the wife. As Christ is head of the church, there's authority that's in there. Uh, but our leadership is supposed to be servanthood. And I'm going to get to this, uh, ladies, that, that you're, the, the man that you're married to uh, is supposed to um, sacrifice everything for you, for your benefit and for your good. I don't know if your husband's that way yet or not, 
but hopefully when the, with the Holy Spirit's help and his work, he will begin to orient himself in such a way that he loves you with every, every decision that he makes, everything that he hears, uh, he hears stuff from you, he gets, he gets influence from you, um, that he, everything that he does, his whole being is, is oriented toward service to you. So we're coming there. Don't, so don't worry, I get two Sundays to talk to men about that. I'm only spending one Sunday trying to talk to you about uh, maybe obeying your husband in some ways. Um, it's not about ability. Uh, it, it's, I'm going to say it, it's limited in its, in its scope. It's kinda, I'll probably say this on this next slide, but I'll, I'll reiterate it again here. Um, it's not a command to, to, to obey every man. It's not for every man. This is to your husband in particular. It's limited in its scope. Uh, it's not about whether or not can a, can a lady ha- be a, a commander. Some of my best commanders in the army have been women. And I, I wonderfully, and it was awesome time to be underneath their authority in the army as, uh, in command. It's not about, not about a command ability. It's not about whether uh, a lady has no, uh, has no leadership skills. That's not the intent when I'm saying this. In fact, uh, if your wife is better at that, maybe that is a delegation that you can give to your, to your wife and just say, you know what, I recognize that God has given you these talents. Run with it. But that doesn't mean you abdicate your responsibility. Delegating does not mean you abdicate your responsibility uh, for what happens. And, I, and we'll, hopefully we'll, I'll cover that in a second. Uh, it's not micromanaging. Um, if you... If you hear me say that you need to listen to your husband, he's like, I need you to wear these shoes today. I need you to pray like this. I need you to... That's not what this is saying at all. That's micromanaging. And husbands, that is not in alignment with what God is going to tell you to do in his commands. The Lord Jesus doesn't micromanage the way the church operates. And you are to be like Christ in dealing with your, with your wife. It's not micromanaging... Uh, it's not even not having an opinion. Husbands, if you do not let your wife uh, influence you, your marriage is going to be horrible. The number one predictor of, of divorce, uh, one of them, I admit there's probably a couple of them, but one of them is, is uh, does the husband accept influence from his, from his wife? And if a couple comes in, and I'm, I'm, my, my day job, I'm a, a marriage and family therapist, that's my day job, um, and they'll come in and they'll start talking. And if the only the complaint that the wife has against her husband is, uh, he never listens to me. I know we're in a, we're in a bad spot. We're in a very, very, very bad spot um, because that does all sorts of stuff for somebody. And so if you, a husband, if you are listening to this and going, well, that means I don't have to listen to my wife or receive influence from her anymore, uh, you are wrong because you are serving her you are not her master. You are not her master. Her master is the Lord Jesus. And he has given you his daughter. The Father in heaven has given you his daughter to care for and to serve and to love. And that should, that should scare you to no end that one day you will be held accountable to how you treated his daughter. That should scare you to no end, okay? So accept influence from your wife. It's not about being a doormat either. I hope that you have opinions, wives. I hope that you share that often with your, with your husband. I say complain a lot. I like when people come in and they start to complain about stuff, if they can do it without criticism or contempt. Like, I love it because I can work with that. I want to hear, you know, I want my wife to complain about stuff for me. Hi, buddy. Escaped from the Catholic service uh, education, I think. <laughs> Gonna take take over. I'm not sure I'd stop and make sure he gets to see somebody who take care of that. Yeah, with him in this, okay. So there is something about submission that what I when I what I mean by that is not just believing that your husband has has authority, uh, but it's supporting that as well. 
I'm going to give you a couple examples of, of people who, who have done that uh, in a little bit. But submission is voluntary. Again, husbands, it's not your, it's not your role to enforce that. Uh, it's not your job to enforce that. It's your job to love on your wife in such a way that, that she will want to respect your opinions and respect your, your responsibility to carry the family. And, and part of one of the, one of the thoughts is, uh, just on a, maybe on a side note, that for, for wives as you're wrestling with this, um, if your husband is commanded to die for you, when somebody breaks into your house tonight, hopefully it doesn't happen, but if somebody did, and they're a threat to your family, I'm willing to put money down that, that your husband is not going to say, all right, wife of mine, you go take out the bad guy, and I'm going to stay here, and then give me the all clear if you make it. Right? I, maybe in, in, a, in some, some extreme circumstance, maybe you're married to an MMA expert, and you're not it, and maybe then you would send your wife down, but then you better be in close combat and be the shield, the shield man, right? Um, if she's going to be the, the combat lady. But typically, the husband is going to be willing to lay his life down. And that's part of the why the, the you know, is that, think about the Titanic, you know, and the old adage, women and children first, right? And that's the men, we die, yes. <laughs> right? And your, your husband is willing to die for you, so can you, can you at least let him shape the fight on where he's going to lay his life down for you? Can you just let him, let him shape some of that fight where he's going to lay his life down for you and for his children? That's, that's, I think that's a, that's a, a, piece, a, a piece of that. Uh, another thing um, that I'll cover a little bit in when we get towards verse 31, but not yet. There's often a, a, a resistance to, to give a man some respect in that way if he's not respectable. In our culture, um, uh, Egg, Dr. Egridge, we're gonna, I'm going to do a love and respect seminar uh, here shortly. I, got, I, had a pl- I had it planned out, and then it got, some of the dates got changed around because of some training. Uh, opportunities that came up, so I'm going to push that out. Um, but he, 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 uh, he mentions that the song, you know, R S E P C T, uh, respect that means for me, um, was sung by a lady. But if you actually go back, he says, and know who actually wrote it, it was a man who wrote it. He and when he sang it, like two years before, uh, was it Aretha Franklin uh, picks it up and sings it, he tried to sing it. It didn't go anywhere until she picked it up and ran with it and began to sing. So that song was actually written by. It was written by a man. And our culture is so love-infused, so when I go and I, I start to beat up your husbands uh, in a couple of weeks from now on, on what their role and responsibilities are to love their wives, uh, you, will, you, will, you will not be able to hear me say, husbands, listen, if your wife is unlovable, then don't love them until they are. Right? You would all rightfully be like, What? Yeah, I, I, I told my wife, Julia, I said, Julia, right now you're unlovable, and I won't love you until you get that way. Right. That, would, that would churn your hearts wrong, right? It would hit you wrong in all, sorts of, in all sorts of ways, as it should, because that command to love unconditionally is given uh, regardless of my wife's lovability rating. I'm going to say on the other side of the fact is on the same level that, that wives respecting towards your husbands, falling underneath some of their things, is it's not I'll respect you and become respectable. I will do that uh, as unto the Lord because I love Jesus. And hopefully in the midst of that, you can read the Peter passage, in the midst of that, if your husband is going astray, that through that obedience to Christ, not necessarily to him, obedience to Christ, that you'll win him over and he will become respectable. Much like if you love on your wife unconditionally and she's not lovable and there are opportun- many, many opportunities for that to happen. Something, something unique happens when you begin to just obey God 
in his, at his word and say, do these things regardless of what the other person is doing, do them. Because it is the right thing to do and it is from my heart that we do, that we do these things. So in this particular case, submission is, is voluntary. Now, you're like, does that mean I get it to not do it or do it? Well, sin, you, you, can, you can sin any time that you want. That's, that's the nature of, of that. And I've said, if you say, well, I'm only human, I'm going to mess this up, uh, so I'm going to do what I want. And I have many people sitting in my counseling office that tell me that too. They're like, well, you know, if I look at porn this day, then why does it matter if I, why well, I just keep looking at it? I'm going to do it anyway. Because sin is terrible and you should stop it. Right? You, you don't sin more to get God's, more of God's grace. Paul covers that. And I, I understand that there's a tension. Romans chapter 7, I don't do what I want to do. Uh, I'm a slave uh, to a lot of my, my, my passions. And then I have Romans chapter 8, both are true. Romans chapter 8, who is going to free me from this? Uh, the, the grips of sin, it is, it is Christ Jesus who can separate me from the love of God. There's no one, no height, depth, le- uh, width, right? Read Romans 7 and 8 and, and just hold that they were, those are both true at the same time in the midst of that. Now, are you going to be able to, uh, are you going to do this well? Hopefully. And maybe is it hard because your husband is a jerk? Yes. Now, if your husband's a jerk, that's a whole other matter. Uh, you may want to start to, to, to tell uh, other men in the church about it, and we can take your husband out and, and say some, some manly words to him, right? And help, help Matthew 18 him onto the right path. All right, so there are ways that you can, you can wake your man up from his, his stupor if he is not loving on you in the way that the Bible is going to describe but hopefully there are some ladies in your life that can help you. If, you're, if your husband's in particularly a difficult person to live with, uh, on how, how to do this better. Again, this is a, a general principle, and so some people are going to be like, well, is, is Paul only talking about, uh, is, it, is it culturally centered? And I'm going to say it's not, and it can't be, because he, he attributes this not, not just to the region around him, but he contributes it to uh, creation, part of the creation order, and part of who Christ is theologically. Right? Why am I supposed to submit myself to my husband unto the Lord? Uh, he says, because Christ is the head of the church, and as the church submits to Christ, so you must do that to your husband. It's grounded in theology. It's not grounded in cultural understanding of that. Now, that's a, a, a larger principle. What does that look like in your, in your marriage here? Um, could it be a little bit different? Does it mean that the man is the one who has to work outside the home all the time and the, and the wife has to stay home and, and take care of the kids? That's not necessarily what that, that means. Is there a scenario where the, the guy can stay home and watch the kids? I think there is. From a scripture standpoint, we can talk about what does that look like. But in, but in terms of overall, who's, who's the one that God is going to hold responsible for, for where, where your relationship is, where your relationship is going, and how connected you are uh, to Christ Jesus. The one that God is going to hold responsible is your husband. He's the one that, that God is going to look at and hold responsible. And if that's the case, I, just, I need you to, to help him out. Help him do that. And not be a, a, a person that resists that. Someone has to, I, we are equals in Christ. I, the Bible clearly says that. I get saved the same way that my wife does. But someone has to be like that 51% responsible. I don't know if you ever, uh, one of the, there's a scout game that you play, you get on a board, maybe it's not just a scout, but you're on two by fours and you have straps and you're trying to walk together. Try to, try to walk on a board strapped together and you're not synchronizing, maybe even the three-legged race, maybe that would be another example you may understand. Um, if everybody just was doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, you're going to fall over. God has an order for things. Let your husband sing some cadence and get in sync with that. God has given him some dreams. Let him dream. Cheer him on. Because God's going to hold him responsible. 
he doesn't take care of you. But with that, some examples. And maybe this will be maybe even better. Um, I say limited in, it, in its in submission. Uh, again, it's to your own husband, not to all men. Um, it's limited as unto the Lord. So if your husband's telling you to do something that's illegal, unethical, and immoral uh, against what the Word of God says, uh, you, you can say no. It's limited. Some examples. All right, here's, here's Sarah. And this, I think, is an important piece. I bring up Sarah because we read that in 1 Peter chapter 3. Paul, uh, Peter, excuse me, Peter picks up on, and, and after talking about uh, submitting yourself to your husband, he's like, like Sarah did, uh, by calling Abraham Lord. And that sounds really strange. We go back into Genesis chapter 18 where the story happens. Uh, God, or the, the three angels, are talking to, uh, to Abraham, and they're like, hey, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham's really old at this particular time. Sarah's listening in the back, and they're like, you're going to have a son. And Sarah's like, I'm old, and my Lord is old. Not going to happen. Now, you're like, how does, how does Peter jump from <clears throat> respect your husbands, uh, and, he, and he quotes that particular verse? Uh, I don't know. In a lot of ways, I don't understand that, where he's going with that. But he, he, he focuses on this, this, word, this word, Lord. Not like he's the king, or not like he's the, the Adonai, or not he's like the, the, the savior of the people of, of her, N- none of that stuff. I think why he focuses in on that is, he's like, I know he's my husband, and I think it's silly, whatever, whatever he may believe in, uh, but there's something about her supporting him in that. I think Peter's picking that up. Something about, well, if it happens, I'll, 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 I don't think it will, but I think it's maybe kind of silly, uh, but... I'm going to try to support Abraham and, and his plan. And she does. And there's a terrible thing happens right after that, right? She tries to support him. Well, I know God told you this. Maybe this is the right way. We can accomplish that task. And uh, he, she's like, here's my servant. Have a baby with her. And it doesn't work out well. But she supported him. I think Peter picks up on that, uh, on that particular one. But that's even... That's maybe too esoteric uh, in, its, in its thought. I've, here's an example of what submission looks like, and I'll, I'll use Jesus as an example of that. Maybe this is even better. Probably way better than even Sarah. Would you say that Jesus, uh, and uh, as, the, as a second person of the Trinity, as the Son, uh, has equal power as the Father? Uh, theologically, the answer is yes, right? Jesus has as much power and authority as the Father. But the Bible says something very curious, right? It says that Jesus, this is Philippians chapter 2, uh, didn't, didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead he, he, he became a form of a servant, right, to serve. So here's Jesus, full equality with, with God the Father, because he is God the Son. All glory, honor, and privilege are his together. So now we're, this is Matthew chapter 26. He's in the garden praying to the Lord. And he, he says to the Father what he doesn't want. He's like, Father, I take this cup from me. Talking about his death. Take this cup from me. Now, part of that, I know he's speaking out of his, his humanness. Uh, Jesus is as fully God and he's fully human. And in this particular moment, I bet he's speaking a lot of out of his humanity, uh, knowing the enormity of what he's about to go and endure on the cross, which is separation from the Father, which would be, which would be terrible for anybody, but also to bear the weight of the sins of the whole world upon you. Do you think you would have some anxiety about that? The answer would be yes, you would have some anxiety about that. Uh, and it may sound strange if I say Jesus was having some anxiety about that. And it's, it's written in the scriptures in that way. I, I can try to pretend and just say, well, Jesus was doing that for our benefit. So you could feel okay if you had, you're a little anxious about some of your problems. Um, but I, I think that's going to miss the point if I go down that route. He tells the Father exactly how he is feeling at that point. He doesn't hold back from them. He shares his opinion. But at the end of that, he says, not my will be done, but yours. I I put my trust in you 
that, Father, that you love me enough that, that I trust that you're going to take us to a place uh, that's good. So Jesus places himself under, uh, under the authority of God the Father on a vo- voluntarily doing that. Because he trusted the Father enough to fulfill the plan that they had put together that Christ, even though he was going to die, he was going to be resurrected again. And Jesus said, no one takes my life, I lay my life down freely. Right? Again, more voluntary uh, servitude under the Father. So if nothing else, in the scripture, we have an example of what what does submission look like when equality is there. Jesus trusted the Father to carry through the plan. So I'm asking you wives, trust your husbands with the plan that they have. God has placed in their heart, uh, hopefully, a desire to serve you and the family for for everyone's benefit and for and for uh, better connection to God. That's the man's responsibility, and that's one that he carries with him. And I'm just asking you to give your husband a chance with that and support him. Don't just believe he can make those choices, but support him in those particular things. And again, it's between you and the Lord. You do this as unto the Lord. And it sounds strange to our Western ears that says everyone needs to be independent and that somehow if I'm under somebody's authority, that means I lose my, I'm a, I'm a slave or that I'm a doormat. I, that's none of those things. Is Jesus a slave? Was Jesus a doormat? He was not, but he, he placed himself under the care of the Father. And that's the example for us all. Amen. Let me pray. Gracious God in heaven, thank you so much for your word that you have given us the order of things. They are not meant for our, our harm, not meant for our stifle of our own individualness uh, or the, the calling that you've given us, each one. Uh, but Father, it's, it is there uh, to help us in our togetherness as a married couple. Father, we are one. We have different roles to play within that, within that oneness. Uh, much like you and your son Jesus are one. Father, help us to, to obey your word. May it be meaningful. And may we bring you honor and glory in the things that we say, think, and do. Amen.